with that, we get to another fundamental of Shavuos, which is the next generation. Right? Uh, at Shavuos, we all know Hashem is looking for guarantors, and the guarantors that work are the future generations. So as another part and component of learning Torah, coming from Shavuos, is education. And that's uh, Sean Barris theme for tonight, so please. Thank you. Uh, I have faced my own share of setbacks, struggles, stumbles. I believe most of you have, besides for my wife who's sitting right there. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, there are choices that I made that I regret, both personally and as a parent. We often second guess ourselves. We question the choices we made, especially when we see our children not fulfilling their full potential. As a parent, watching your child question, doubt, or worse, stray from the path, it hurts. It's a pain that's more than physical. It resonates with a hurt that truly pierces the soul. The Rabbi Nayyam Yom writes, Jewish wealth is not houses and gold. The everlasting Jewish wealth is being Jews who keep to our mitzvahs and bring into the world children and grandchildren who, bring, who keep to our mitzvahs. This underscores the Jewish tradition and observance is the, tr is the truest form of wealth. We just came from Shavuos, the famous Medrash Rabba from Shir uh, The story of Ar Sinai, the Yidin were Ar Sinai, and they wanted a, gar a guarantor. The Ebeshter said, I'm not giving the Torah until there's a guarantor. So we offered a couple of guarantors, our forefathers and Avim. Finally, we said, our children, will be the guarantors. And the Ebesha says, accept it, I will give you for the sake of the children. The significance of Jewish education in ensuring that our children are guarantors is indisputable. And if you don't believe me, check your tuition bill. One of the most quoted psukim in Mishli, by Shlema Melch, is what? Chanoich l'nar al pidarki. Train a child in a way that he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Rashi says on this Pasik that you should teach a what you teach a child will affect them for the rest of their lives. Jewish education is, is Judaism's paramount value. It is the entire Messiah. It's the reason why we are doing the mitzvahs today like they did years ago, generations ago. And yet comes the question, there is no biblical commandment to educate a child in the observance of mitzvahs. Nowhere in the Torah does it say clearly that there is a mitzvah to educate in the observance of mitzvahs in the Torah. The Rebbe asks Shailah in Chedek Lamed Hay of Parashat Vayera, he asks very simply, profoundly, how is it possible that the Abishter made a Jewish boy or girl, 12 or 13, responsible for mitzvahs at 12 or 13, yet there is no counter to that by educating them in order that they should be ready to observe the Torah and mitzvahs. You, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. If you're going to make them responsible at 12 or 13, why didn't the Abishter come along and say, educate them? Inevitably, if you don't, unfortunately, what would more than likely happen is they won't be ready, and they will, God forbid, sin, or not fulfill the mitzvahs properly, etc., etc. So the question the Rebbe asks is a paradox here. You made everybody responsible. You made 12, 13-year-olds responsible to the mitzvahs with everything that's involved in the punishments and everything that's involved in somebody that transgresses a sin. Yet, 
I'm not commanding you to do it. Nope. Don't worry about it. So the Rebbe asks this question in Chayil Kamatei. There are some Puskim that hold that there is a mitzvah to rice, but the Rebbe concludes that most Puskim agree that there is no uh, minatayra, uh, a chiyuv to educate your, your, uh, in, your children. As the Rebbe quotes from Shochan Ar Chalav, a child is exempt from all commands and also his father is not biblically obligated to educate him in mitzvahs, and the obligation is only rabbinical. So for that, I will start, I will open up a Gemara. In Bab Metzia, Hey Hey Ahmed Aleph, where it says something profound. Well, I, I found this and uh, found it very interesting. Hold on a minute, let me find it here. Where is it? Ahmed Aparnach, Ahmed Yechran. Rabbi Aparnach says in the name of Yechran. Kol Shu Talmud Chacham. Whoever is a Talmud Chacham, or Benoit Talmud Chacham, and his son is a Talmud Chacham, or Ben Benoit Talmud Chacham, and his grandson is a Talmud Chacham, Shuv Ein Torah Pesachas Mizari. Torah will never cease from his descendants. Loyla, forever. Shenamar, it says in the Pasuk, Panis, Vais, Brisli, Loy, Mushim, Picha, Pis, Zerazachim, Pis, Zerazachim, Omar Hashem, Mayat, Avedoyim. It's a Pasuk in Shayo, after Yeshayo is berating the Yidin for all their various the lack of connection to Hashem, concludes with something very hopeful, which is this Pasuk, which says that I will always, the, the Torah will never leave the Yidin. Ask him, my Omar Hashem, Omar Kadosh Baruch Ani Arab Lecha I am your guarantor. My Mayatav Yadoyim, why forever? It only says three generations. Says Gemara, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be here, I'm going After three generations, if you have a, Grandfather, a son, and a grandson that fulfill Torah, learn Torah, Tamid Chachamim, Torah will always return home. Now, at first, when I learned this, I was, you know, I started counting my father, myself, and I said, okay. <laughs> so, work needs to be done. But then, I started randomly doing a little bit of Daf Yomi, and there's a guy by the name of Shirley Bornstein. Where's my papers here? Hold on. Who alerted me to a beautiful Sam Seifer, which I will do inside, because I don't want to mess this up. So on this Torah, the Sam Seifer says, on this Gemara, Aktim Vaimer, I will preface and say, there is a principle in the Chazal. It's quoting this Gemara. Some Sefer is quoting this Gemara. And he quotes the, the Pasuk of the Gemara, the, the Gemara Pots. Torah will always return to the children. Why? Says like this, it is for this reason that Torah will always be Machseres HaLachsanishla Torah will always come back home, that Hashem said, I don't need you to educate your kids. I don't need you to educate in the mitzvahs. Why? Because on a level, Torah will always come back. And he quotes the, uh, the, from the, from the, um, the bestin. If, if the bestin sees a child eating on the vela, which is a non-slaughtered kosher animal, which is a love, the, the best and don't pull him away. We don't worry about him. Why? Because Torah will always come back home. Why? That a child who is the child of who? Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Who are our grandparents? Me. You. Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. That is our legacy. And he says here that that is the reason why Hashem said, Zirus, you know, like Zirus and Makdim and Don't jump on them. Why? 
כשהגיע לאחר מצווה, ממילא תרס תחזר על אכסניה שלו. Naturally a child will figure it out. So on one level, and who is the order of it, as Yekim Mordech said, who is the order of that? Who is the guarantor? Not the children. The Abish is the guarantor, the children, they're coming back. It's a lock, it's locked. We're good. Now, so that, you know, gave me a little bit of relief. <laughs> I was ready to stop, but I wanted to continue with the Rebbe's answer, which I think brings it to another level. Because the Chassam Sefer seems to be saying, under, bas, under Bar Mitzvah, they're going to sort of get it. We know. So the Rebbe asks this Shaila, and he answered it incredibly, actually. I mean, the way I understand it, the way I've learned it. In light of the question again, how is it possible that the Abishter made a child, a 12 or 13 year old, responsible for mitzvahs, and yet doesn't give the mitzvah to be a child? Yes, the Chacham will come along and say, listen, practically, you got to teach them. So there is a mitzvah, a mitzvah, to teach a child, because, you know, otherwise, we need it. But on a certain level, we don't need it. But the question still remains, how did the Eivishta come along, make a yid responsible, a girl of 12, a boy of 13 responsible for mitzvahs, and yet, no mitzvah? And that would be usually an incredible chiddush, actually. And he says, a 13-year-old and a 12-year-old boy are not biblically expected to fulfill every single mitzvah. Not. The Torah, by not mandating a command to educate in observance, is informing us a lesson that religious observance is a, religious observance is a journey. It's not an instant responsibility and expectation from Hashem. Rather, from that eight onward, a girl turns 12, a boy turns 13. It's a process. You start the process. You keep going. You fall. You make mistakes. So long as he's an active process of learning, searching, and moving forward, the Abishter considers it as part of the mitzvah. Even if it's invalid, even if he's sinning, I would say. Why? Because the Gemara, as the Gemara says in Yavamis, we are not angels. We are people. And the Abishad does not give something that is beyond our capabilities. The Chachamu came along and said, listen, you got to gotta give chinuch to your children. Start them early. Chanech pidarka with all the mafarshim, etc., etc. That is the Rebbe's conclusion. And the Rebbe proves it from a bunch of places. I'll pick one place to prove it. He proves it from the life of Avram Avinu. In Chai Sada, right before Yitzchak needs to get married, it says about Avram Avinu, Avram, Zak, and Baba Yamim. Avram was getting old. Baba Yamim. What is Baba Yamim coming into his days? It's a double, it's almost a double lushet. Avram, Zak, and Baba Yamim. What is Baba Yamim coming to teach us? And the, the Chachamim answered the question, Baba Yami means that he served God perfectly every single day of his life. Basic question comes along, as the Ramam says in Chochasa Avodah Chachamim, Avram Avinu himself served the Vodah Zarah. There are opinions till 3, till 40, till 48. The Ramam says 40. But he says clearly, Avram, Oyvind, Avad Zara, with, all, with his family, with everybody else who was nor custom. So how can you possibly say that Avram Ravinu was perfect in all his days? It doesn't make sense. I mean, you can't deny the history. And the answer is that, based on what we're saying now, that although Avram Avinu did not serve the Abishter, uh, did not find the Abishter completely until he was 3, 40, or 48, depending on the opinions, since from the moment that he was born, he was searching for Hashem. 
and looking and wondering and questioning, every single one of his days were complete. I'll that what we just said earlier. When a boy is born, uh, he turns 12 or 13, he starts the process, biblically. And the Abishta understands that a child sometimes will search and sometimes will make mistakes. And sometimes things won't be as clear as we hope that they will be. But one day, just like Abraham Avinu, things can turn around. There's a story, I was you know, very involved in this whole chinuch thing, which was amazing for me. And I started Googling some stories, chinuch stories. You know, every speech needs to have a couple of stories. I ended up on a, a speech of Rabbi Y.Y. Y. Jacobson. And he says like this, there's a story of a woman who was brought up in a secular home. And she went off. She went Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity. She went searching for four years. And then something happened in the family. She converted. And he says he heard the story firsthand from the woman. She converted to Christianity. Something happens in the family, which I call Tari Machseris al A knock on the door came. And uh, her mother says, you got to come home. There's a, something happening in the family. It was an emergency in the family. you got to come home. She comes home. And she's sitting with her mother. And her mother says, I wish we had a Seder. In my house, we had a Seder. We never had a Seder. And I wish you would experience that tradition. For some odd reason, somehow, a friend called her. I'm going to Crown Heights for Pesach. She ends up in Crown Heights by Machan Khan. The year that, this is, so she ends up in Machan of Pesach. She's there. That was the year that the Rebbe came to visit Machan Khan before his Seder. She comes in. She's, you know, she sees the Rebbe. She sees the Rebbe's face. She's extremely inspired. And she ends up becoming closer and closer. She stays for Shavuos, and she continues. And then she makes a stock of her life, and she realizes what, what she was doing. And she writes to the Rebbe everything that she did. From the beginning to the end, every detail. And she tells Yossi what she thought. She would get a letter saying, do this, fix this, do this, get your stuff together. This is your ticket. And the Rebbe writes to her something, to me, I found amazing. The Rebbe quotes a passage from Megillah, which is not a passage, I don't know, passage, uh, the, the Pesukim. Yagaitu mutsasi al tamen, yagaitu mutsasi al tamen, yagaitu mutsasi tamen. If somebody puts effort into something. If I worked hard and I didn't find, you don't believe him. If I worked and I found, if I didn't work and I found, you don't believe him. But if somebody says I worked, and I found, you believe him. And whatever Rebbe says, your Yagaiti were the years that you were there. Your searching brought you here. Move on. Sometimes our searching is in the mistake. And that was the Rebbe's response to her. And she said that uplifted her tremendously. I, do I have more time for one more story or no? I'm going to bring this back to the children. He says one more story in another speech that I found. He says a story of his brother, Simon Jacobson. And he says, Simon Jacobson was giving a share in Manhattan. And for a few months, a, uh, a boy, a, a 20 year old boy, 20, 30 year old man, he just come and sit, sat for two, three months, sat quietly, didn't do anything. So at one point, he worked up the courage to go over to Simon. And he tells Simon, I'm a, I don't know how old he was, 20, 30 years old. Simon realizes there's something, you know, he couldn't talk correctly. There was obviously something going on there. His motor skills weren't okay. He couldn't talk clearly. And he talks to Simon slowly and he says, Simon, I never met my mother or father. So Simon says, what do you mean that my father? Where do they live? So they live in Manhattan, they live right here, they live in a, in a penthouse. 
what do you do? I don't know. I get a check. What, what's your story? So when I was born, they told me, they told my parents, uh, neurological uh, issues. You don't want to deal with this child. You know, they, 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 they were big socialites in Manhattan. You don't want to deal with them. Move on. So they institutionalized him. And they never met him. So Simon was very shook up. Uh, I need to do something. He picks up the phone and he calls his father. And the father, and Simon says to the father, hi, um, my name is Simon. I'm here with your son. Click. Simon's like, oh, that must have been a mistake. Picks up the phone again. Uh, Simon says, uh, hi, I'm here with your son. We hung up. No, no, you didn't hang up. You didn't get the message the first time. Click. So he calls the mother. And the mother starts crying. She says, listen, my husband made a decision 20, 30 years ago, whatever it was, that we do not want to have any attachment to this child. Whatever the issues were when he was born, we don't want anything to do with him. Finished. But she's crying and she says, listen, if you can convince my husband, I'm ready to meet him. So he per perseveres and he calls Simon again and Simon says, you know, Simon speaks to the father again, the father says to him, fine, I'll meet him, but you need to be there. So they go to a huge penthouse, big socialite, he says he couldn't believe there was such a big house in Manhattan, overlooking the park, beautiful home. And they're talking, you know, a little elevator talk. Everybody's uncomfortable, nobody's looking at each other, nobody's looking at each other's eyes. Simmons says, listen, guys, we're here for a reason. We're here to connect. Meet your son. So the son indicates that he wants to say something. And the son says, Simmons says, and he, you could tell that his son really practiced because he couldn't really talk. And his son says like this, mama, papa, and I'm quoting. I know that I am not perfect, but mama, papa, Says, over the years, I've come to realize that you are not perfect either. I have forgiven you for not being perfect. Perhaps one day you will forgive me for not being perfect. Of course, the mother got up, it turned into a cry fest, and Simmons snuck out. You know, that was it, <laughs> it was over. I just want to finish. I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time. I heard these stories and I was very involved in this kind of, and I, and I asked myself, and can I accept, can you accept a child that's not perfect? Can I look at their journey as progress, perhaps imperfect? Can we see them for what they are, not for what they are now, perhaps what they can be? but with the understanding that the Abish there is loving, forgiving of all their imperfections? Can I have the belief and trust in Hashem that Tarul be Machzeres Alaksan Yishla, Tarul will come back home to every single one of our children? And can I forgive myself for the mistakes and errors that I made in my own journey knowing that the Abish there has? When we all merit to meet, to bring children and grandchildren that keep the title of mitzvahs, may all the suffering end. May the hostages come home, physically, today. And may we be united with our brother Yitzchak and Yaakov, with our loved ones with the coming of Shia today. Thank you. Shalom Bear. That was uh, very moving. Thank you.